So, a lot has changed since the end of season one. I'm in a new city, in a new house, it's a whole new life. With so much to do around the house, so much to explore in this new town, how am I going to ease myself into this new season? Oh, I know, how about I sink 40 hours into a JRPG? This is Brand New Relic, the series where I finally play... Hold on, it's been so long, I forgot what I say. The classic games I never got to try. The classic games I never got to try. Got it. The series where I finally flay the... Okay, nope, moving on. So first, spoiler alert for Final Fantasy... Wait, that can't be right. This is three, but I'm playing six. Yep, being a Final Fantasy fan. Would that be a Final Fantasy? Or a Final Fantasy? Nope, none of those work. Being a fan of this series must have been very confusing if you lived in America. You got Final Fantasy for the NES in 1990, then Final Fantasy II for the Super Nintendo in 1991, then Final Fantasy III in 1994, and then three years later you had Final Fantasy VII. What happened to 4, 5, and 6? Well, the actual Final Fantasy II, III, and V were never actually released in North America, so they renamed Final Fantasy IV as Final Fantasy II, and renamed Final Fantasy VI as Final Fantasy III, so while you thought you were playing 1, 2, and 3, you were actually playing 1, 4, and 6. It might be hard to keep track, but you can remember from this simple mnemonic device. Felicity? I've never actually liked Felicity. And now to play the actual Final Fantasy VI. Yes! The release of Final Fantasy VII must have confused American gamers and made some poor marketing person's head just completely explode. But the game was so instantly iconic that no one seemed to care. At the time, it was considered the best Final Fantasy in the series, if not one of the greatest games of all time. However, nowadays, it seems that Final Fantasy VI is more fondly remembered. And if you're playing a brand new Relic drinking game and took a drink every time I said Final Fantasy, first off, my apologies, and second, why? So it's time to boot up my Super Nintendo emulator and get to playing. I know that Final Fantasy 3 slash 6 is the third slash sixth Final Fantasy game. Okay, I'm in. So in this land, there was a War of the Magi. No watches or hair being sold here. It's a world with no magic and lots of steampunk, so basically a hot topic. But a magical creature known as an Esper has been spotted, and it's up to me, a sorceress enslaved in some high-tech armor, to take it down. I just wish this story was more original, you know? So while the credits roll, two random soldiers and I walk for several minutes, like a fantasy remake of Jerry. And then I'm in the town of Narsh, where I'm fighting... mummies? I'm here for this music. We find the frozen Esper, which then assists the soldiers, and... Well, that's shocking. I wake up and I'm no longer controlled by my armor. And I get to choose my name. As always, I'm going with Jem. An old man helps me escape through the mines, and... Yeah, I've had those nights. And apparently I was under the control of a guy named Kefka, the writer of Metamorphosis? And huh, what does this fascist dictatorship remind me of? We meet a thief named Locke, who has the cutest little finger wag. He tries to help me, and just when all seems lost, the most adorable creatures arrive to- Wow, okay, that's terrifying. Turns out I have amnesia. The Dark Descent. This secret entrance might be useful someday? Yeah, sure, I guess. And we finally get a tutorial. About 45 minutes into starting the game. I need more experience in the world? I get what you're saying. Snap, snap, green, green, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. We meet the young ruler of- and Bylock? Edgar here is just an HR disaster waiting to happen. He hits on all the women, including women of God, and is grooming minors. So glad to be working with this guy. We get a flashback where we meet Edgar's twin brother, Youth. Actually, his name is Sabin? 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 It's that. And the Empire's down to smash, apparently. Good to know. Kefka's on his way, and he seems like a real nice guy. He's looking for me, but Edgar doesn't give me up. Edgar doesn't let me down. Oh, Edgar, don't ever change. 
Actually, no, please, change completely. Turns out he opposes the evil empire and works with the rebel ele- Yeah, I mean the, to the returners. They're called the returners. So he's on our side. Way to go, you misogynistic creep. But Kefka sees through the lie and responds with a touch of arson, or as he calls it, a barbecue. Hate to see what he calls a pig roast. Edgar puts out the fire by submerging his castle underground, which is just so badass. We have a fight in which I use magic, which warrants a long conversation while the two enemies in battle armor just wait ever so patiently on the side. And then we escape on chocobos! I remember these guys from the other game! So now comes the central conflict. Who am I? Why do I have magical powers? Why does the Empire want me and why are they so down to smash? That's what we're going to spend a few dozen hours finding out. We hit up South Figaro where we meet a lone mercenary who will do anything for money. His name is Boba Fa- I mean, Shadow. This guy, who apparently would slit his mother's throat for a nickel, Jesus H, doesn't want to talk to us. So... bye. And I get sprint shoes, so I can run now. We travel to a nearby cave where we battle some Street Fighter rejects, and who is that Shadow Man? We fight Mardi Gras streamers before facing off against this guy and his pet... I poo. <clears throat> and I get my first game over. I try again, and just when it all seems lost, here comes... You know what? I have to make a choice. I'm calling him Sabin. He fights with a technique called the Blitz, which he teaches to me while looking directly at me. So much for the fourth wall. The brothers are united, and what is that face? We make it to the Returner's hideout, where I'm asked if I'll join the Resistance. End of game. Okay, fine, I'll do it. But the Empire is closing in, so we have to head back to Narsh, because why not? And I love the sound when I can't do something. Then we meet the boss, Ultros. So, okay, in this river rafting adventure, our mission is to keep the character Bannon safe from harm. So you know what's fun? When the boss you're fighting can destroy him in one hit, causing a game over. That's very fun. But after several minutes, we finally defeat him, and, uh... Bye, Sabin. So our heroes split up, and we get a plot recap like an old Batman episode. Edgar and Jem race toward Nosh while protecting Bannon. But what about Sabin, who was swallowed by the raging waters? And... With the help of one of those adorable, terrifying monsters, we get to choose which character we want to follow first. So Jem, Bannon, and Edgar head toward Narsh. Or not. We wander around for several minutes because somehow I was supposed to know that there was a secret switch behind these rocks. This secret entrance might be useful someday? Yeah, sure, I guess. Okay, that's on me. Anyway, we make our way back through the caves and return to this dude's house. First story done. So now we follow Locke, who's back in South Figaro, demonstrating his astounding stealth capabilities. I need to dress up as a merchant and bring an old man some cider, because of course. So I confront a merchant, and... I love video games so much. So now I can sneak around and meet people. Like this guy. Sir, this is an Arby's. So then we meet a new character. Former Empire General, current Empire Defector, Celis. We rescue her and go to steal a clock key from the sleeping guard. I'm sorry, what nerd chooses stealing is wrong? And it turns out this guard is dreaming about food, which makes him the most relatable character in the game. I get the relic True Knight, which protects party members, and Celis and Locke are already sharing one bed. Noice. We fight a mutant bike and our second story is suddenly done. Time to follow the gun show. He meets up with Shadow, we kill some stray cats, and then we sneak onto an enemy base where we find out that they're storming the defense of Marajack Castle. We meet the leader of the castle, Cyan. Oh, I love that color. He confronts the Empire army while the soldiers do... whatever this is. He defeats the commander and we meet General Leo, who could be my friend if he wasn't my enemy. Yeah, man, that's how enemies work. Kefka strikes back at Doma Castle by poisoning the river like he's the penguin or something. We try to fight him, but he hits us with dad jokes and then releases the poison. I don't feel so good. Turns out among the many casualties are Cyan's wife and child. He's really having a bad day today. So Sabin intercepts the daintiest sounding fight I've ever heard. He joins our party in what's starting to look like a Mortal Kombat lineup. We make our way to an enchanted forest and board a ghost train. Where a random ghost joins our party, look at how happy it is. And we're told there's no escape. Except there's an escape. We make our way to the front of the train and then we're suddenly fighting it like some weird Buster Keaton movie. We take it down just in time for Cyan to watch his family board, and damned if this isn't really heartbreaking to watch. We reach Baron Falls, which actually looks pretty full to me, and Shadow just pieces out. Bye, dude. So I'm gonna have to jump! We meet a young man named Gao. God, this has more characters than a Robert Altman movie. And... Uh, okay, bye. 
We eventually track him down, and this is absolutely how fights are supposed to look. But he joins our party, and then someone we've never seen before walks in, gives me a tutorial, and then... Okay, that was adorable. After a long journey, Gao leads us to a treasure that will allow us to breathe underwater. So we butch Cassidy off this cliff, and we're treated to a Sam Raimi shot. We wash up in the town of Nikea, and why do so many people randomly own suits of armor? Also, my new favorite insult is Licentious Howler. We get on a ferry, and then I'm just told that we reach Narsh. We get a whole MCU's worth of characters in one room. The Empire Cometh is my least favorite O'Neill play. But indeed, the Empire Cometh. So we face off against Kefka, send him packing, and reach the Frozen Esper, who really seems to take to me. Jam and the Esper, sitting in a tree. And then the Esper turns me into... that. Apparently witnesses saw me screaming across the sky. So now I have to go find... me. We go back to Figaro Castle, and like John Mayer, Sabin leaves to run through the halls of his high school. We get a flashback where we find out Edgar and Sabin were supposed to rule the land together. But Sabin wanted to wear tank tops, so they put the fate of the kingdom into a coin flip. One chose freedom, the other diplomacy, in a scene that must hit real hard for William and Harry. Anyway, we submerge the castle again, and I can't help but wonder how much underground infrastructure we're destroying here. We meet up with Shadow again, who will join our party for 3,000 bucks. No thanks! We reach the town of Jador, where everyone is obsessed with opera. So it's the hometown of Terence McNally? We visit the Barnes Museum, check out an auction, and get told we look dorky. We know, but hey! Then it's off to Zozo, which is difficult, and I hate it. You're constantly battling tough enemies, like the... Gabbledygack. I didn't know Dr. Seuss worked on this. I climb to the top of this building and face off against this dude, who seems like he might have some serious back problems. In the building, we find Jem. guru roo roo Girls, same. And then we meet an Esper who's not frozen in ice. Turns out that War of the Magi was between humans and espers many years ago. And Jem might be the missing link between the two. And when an Esper dies, they can transfer their ability to someone else. So... yoink? We reunite with the rest of our party, and then we meet a roguish, gambling airship pilot named Han Sir... Oh, wait, nope, nope. Actually, his name is Setzer. Turns out he's trying to kidnap a famous opera singer so that he can marry her. What is with all the toxic dudes in this game? And it also turns out, Celis looks just like this famous opera singer. So what do you do when you need to use an airship and his pilot wants to kidnap someone that looks just like you? I don't know either, but we're going to the opera house! And who can forget this famous Puccini aria? Yes, we're using Celis as bait to draw this airship pilot out. I love this conductor. And that's a ton of empty seats at this opera. Do they have a marketing director? Celis has to memorize an entire opera on the fly, and this is literally the actor's nightmare. But she pulls it off, and damned if this scene isn't great. It's grand, it's epic, the song is gorgeous, it might be my favorite part in the entire game. Did that chocobo just jump into the orchestra pit? But it turns out Ultros from earlier is going to kill Celis. So we climb up to the rafters, fall to the stage, and defeat Ultros again. All in all, better than La Boheme. Setzer appears, kidnaps Celis, we board his airship, and he's surprisingly cool with being hoodwinked. He agrees to join us as we make our way to Hollywood! Actually, it's Vector, where we sneak into the Empire's armor facility and find out that Kefka is also collecting espers. I know this because he just says it to himself. Like you do. Also, he's restoring the statues, whatever that means. We get a couple more espers for our collection, go to this totally not creepy place, and basically go on an esper massacring spree. You know, like heroes. But wait, was Celis a triple crosser? As a matter of fact, no, she's just super good at reducing the resolution. Speaking of low resolutions, there's this eyesore of a minecart ride. We try to escape, but Kefka's got other plans. Namely, trying to attack us with a couple of claw machines. We return to Jem, who's still looking a bit pale. But I remember where I came from. Turns out I was born in the Esper world. Because you see, when an Esper and a human love each other very much... And wait, my mom is Madonna? That rules. These two make a baby, I think. Aw, I was so cute. But then the evil emperor just crashes this party and my dad uses the force. I mean, uh, esper magic. Shriek. It seems like we'll be okay until... Woo! The emperor makes sure I have the backstory of every Disney princess and raises me as his own. And the world of the espers is officially closed for renovations. Back in the present, we decide that the best way to defeat the empire is to get the Ewoks at... Uh, sorry, the embers... to join us. We need to open up the gate between their world and ours, and as the missing link, I'm the one to make it happen. So now I... Uh, uh, sorry, how do I get down from here? I meet a pickpocket, follow him up to this cliff, and oh, hey, it's one of these guys! And I'm sorry, he slam dances? Welcome to the party, buddy. And then... 
Okay, I took it. And wait, who's that guy? Well, no time to find out. We need to get to the Esper Gate. We sneak into an Imperial base, but it's abandoned, so this may actually be easier than I thought. Except the cave that follows super destroys me several times, so no. Well, this is one Airbnb that's getting a refund request. Cool, no pressure. But guess who followed us here? Don't guess, it's Kefka. Ooh, he, he, he. We have to keep him busy until the gate is open, so I prepare myself for a long and grueling... Oh. Well, cool. We open the door to the monster world, and the weirdest thing happens. Monsters come out. Wow. And then the gate is extra sealed up, so... Sorry, everyone. We try to escape, but our new friends clearly have other plans. Oh, the humanity! We land in the town of Miranda, where I'm immediately proposed to. Yes, I do. I will. And also, is there dogfighting just happening in the middle of the day? What kind of place is this? I return to Vector, which has seen better days. We enter the Imperial Castle to have a chat with the evil Emperor, only to find out... He's not so evil anymore. Yes, apparently the Espers have really gotten to the Emperor, and he's changing his ways. I go on a peacekeeping mission, and like any good peacekeeping mission, it's timed. Then we sit down with the Emperor for a lobster dinner, so fancy! The conversation starts getting pretty uncomfortable, but it turns out the Emperor is really committed to doing the right thing. So cool, end of game. Okay, there's still more stuff to do, so we reunite with Shadow and Salus, who Locke still has a little bit of a thing with. So now I'm on a boat, and am I trying to start something with this general? Anyway, it's been a while since we had some new characters, so here's Strago and his artist daughter, Realm. Turns out this town is secretly harboring folks who have the power of magic. Strago agrees to help us track down the espers, so we go to a secret cave where we reach a sacred shrine and- Oh, hey, Realm! And who should pop up but Ultros again? But Realm jumps into the fray to draw a picture of him. Which works, because apparently he didn't know he was an octopus, which is the most ridiculous- Wait. Do I not know that I'm an octopus? We meet up with the espers, who feel real bad that they, you know, killed some people. But no time to think about that now, because here's Kafka! And... the Emperor? Who knew the evil Emperor was actually evil? Yes, the Emperor was double-crossing us, and Kefka dispatches of the kindly general while quoting Roger Ebert's review of the movie North. The Espers come to help, but are no match for Kefka. We reunite with the rest of the party thanks to Edgar doing what Edgar does best. Getting some. Nope, Edgar, stay away from the child. The Emperor and Kefka decide to recreate Avengers Age of Ultron by taking a chunk of land on a little flight. If they move these three statues out of alignment, it'll rearrange the planet's shape, which feels precarious, but hey, I didn't write the rules. So we gear up, fight a bunch of enemies, including Ultros, again, for some reason. Why are you so obsessed with me? And fight this monster with really powerful sneezes, brutal attacks, and the ability to freeze people. What a fun game this is. We spend a long time fighting our way up to this cutie patootie, and now we're going to confront... Oh, no, Shadow, we could still use your... No, you're just gonna... Okay. But you know that old saying, when God takes away a shadow, he gives you a Celis. But no matter, we're too late to stop Kefka and the Emperor. Come to me, my pretty. And your little dog, too! And when it seems like all is lost, Celis pulls a Kylo Ren, to which Kefka responds with... Ouch. Just... Ouch. The Emperor tries to stop him from getting too much power, don't know why he's choosing now, but okay. And that's a wrap on Emperor Gestal, everyone. Who knows how to stop Kefka from harnessing the ultimate power? The Shadow knows. He gives us the chance to escape, and we make it to the airship with plenty of time. But I'm going to wait. I don't know why, but I feel like this is going to be the better choice. Call it a gut feeling, call it intuition, or call it one of my friends on Patreon warning me that I should wait. Thanks, Anthony! Sure enough, patience is a virtue because we managed to escape with Shadow right before Kefka and the statues destroy the world. And I mean destroy the world. This is going to screw up the syllabi of so many geography classes. Our crew gets scattered to the wind and... Yeah, a bit of an understatement. The world of balance becomes the world of ruin, and evil seems to have triumphed. Many months later. We check in with Celis, who... Um... Lime? Turns out I was sleeping for a year, and oh, no, no, I don't like you like that, dude. Turns out it's not like that, and anyway, he's not doing well. So I play a little Stardew Valley and feed him some fish. But it doesn't seem to help, because you can't just eat raw fish every day, Jeremy Piven. So I go up to a cliff and... Okay, end of game. Actually, no, it was a leap of faith, and now it's time to move on. Shouldn't I have a volleyball with me for this? I arrive in the town of... What's going on? 
Save that child? What child? What's happening? Oh, hey, Sabin, what's new? Long time no- Okay, nope, yeah, I get it. Save the child. Sheesh, everyone's in such a hurry to save a kid from a collapsing building. Phew. So now we've teamed up with Sabin and- Okay, you know what? The next several hours of the game are just spent getting the gang back together. So let's just get through it all with an old-fashioned montage. Oh, I'm glad that Ultros found a way to be useful. Anyway... Okay, is that everyone? I honestly don't remember. And even if it's not, we got a Yeti to join our party because, hey, why not? We work our way up to this magic tower and it's ridiculously difficult. But once we get up to the top, we get a... Jewelry box. Worth it? So now on to... Well, this can't be good. No, seriously, this can't be good. We take on this dapper gent, who's not only difficult to beat, but when you do finally best him, he unleashes an attack that destroys your entire party in one fell swoop. Clearly out of my league here. So what's a human Esper hybrid to do? Well, I could always just quit. But no, I'm not going down that easily. Think of the comments I'd get. So instead I find a nice little patch of desert, and you can call me a barista because I am grinding. I spend two hours here. Two real life hours. Just leveling up my magic skills as much as I possibly can. And after, I cannot stress this enough, two full earth hours, I finally feel ready to go back. I stock up on supplies, make my way back up the tower, confront this guy once more, and now, when he unleashes his final attack... Uh-huh. Yep. Good. And... Yeah! So now I fight the Three Stooges. Can this game get sued for copyright infringement? I tie up some narrative loose ends, and now enough screwing around. It's time to take on Kefka. We split into three groups, make our way through this utterly frustrating dungeon, most of which I can't show you because I forgot to hit record on OBS like a genius, and then... there he is. And apparently he's a birthday party magician now. He hasn't done enough damage apparently, so now he just wants to destroy everything. Why he didn't do that a year ago when he first got this power, I don't know, but whatever, it's clobberin' time! Kefka. Okay, I remember how absolutely unforgiving Sephiroth was in Final Fantasy VII, so I'm prepared to... Oh. Less than three minutes later, on my first try, he's done. I guess grinding for two hours in the desert really does make a difference, huh? But we still have to escape the facility, and what follows is a pretty majestic closing sequence. As each character helps with the escape, we get a beautiful title card, just for them. And of course, where would we be without viewers like you? The world is at peace, we get some pretty stunning 16-bit artwork over the closing credits, an epic 25-minute end sequence comes to a close, and much like Final Fantasy VII, we're stuck on a screensaver until we turn the game off. Holy crap, that was a journey. You still with me? Then let's talk about it some more. Yeah, for real this time. So, okay, I get the hype. I'm amazed by what all the developer Square was able to cram into this one box. When it comes to the look, I have zero complaints. The character designs are unique, the backgrounds are gorgeous, the battles are fun to watch, and the sheer beauty and elegance of the cutscenes, is, it's just breathtaking. I didn't grow up with the Super Nintendo, and so it continues to impress me how the same machine that gave us this, also gave us this. And as with Final Fantasy VII, the soundtrack here is just chef's kiss. A lot of thought and care went into the soundscape of this game. For example, after that amazing opera house scene, that song follows Celis around, popping up at various important moments in her narrative. I also don't know if this was how I played Final Fantasy VII, or the fact that I was willing to spend two hours grinding in the desert, but the battle system here felt a lot more manageable, and the difficulty curve definitely felt more fair. There were only a handful of times when I felt stuck on an enemy, and they were few and far between. The less said about the tentacles, the better. But the real star here is the narrative, and wow, it is dense. 
I don't know about the other entries in this franchise, but once again the stakes were no less than the fate of the entire world, and you felt that weight. These are fleshed out characters, and almost all of them have a moment in the spotlight, letting me know exactly what they're fighting for. By default, I kept thinking of Terra slash Gem as the protagonist, but there really is no main character here, and anyone can lead the charge most of the time. To make a dialogue-heavy game featuring over a dozen characters on a 16-bit piece of hardware must have been an ordeal for the developers to keep track of, but they pulled it off with some of the best moments in digital storytelling that I've come across in a long while. This game has been praised for decades, and there is so much here that absolutely warrants that praise. But I think you know where I'm going with this. So I'm learning something about myself, something I've suspected for a while, but now I'm starting to believe might be true. I don't think I'm a fan of RPGs. Of course, this is a super generalized statement. And on my list of favorite games of all time, Chrono Trigger sits right there. Made by Square, released on the Super Nintendo, Chrono Trigger. And if you remember, one of my favorite games of Season 1 was Knights of the Old Republic. And with my love of narrative games, you'd think that the genre that features some of the richest stories in gaming history would be at the top of my list. And indeed, the stories are always what I think back on. And that's where the problem lies. I'm in a flow, ready to head to the next stop of my adventure when... And I know that I complained about this last season with Final Fantasy VII, and Earthbound, and Pokemon, but few things annoy me in a game as much as this. I haven't gotten used to it, and it still keeps removing me from the experience. And it's not like there aren't ways around it. Knights of the Old Republic's battle system gave you the option of either charging forward or planning your next attack, which was the perfect solution. And even on the Super Nintendo, there were workarounds. Chrono Trigger eliminated random encounters entirely, and that curated battle design made for more engaging gameplay. And even Earthbound, with its randomness, had the foresight to let you auto-win easy battles, which would have helped here during sections where I'm simply trying to get to my destination, only to be interrupted every 30 seconds with a battle that does nothing but extend the playtime. It's exactly this that's kept me from playing a lot of older RPGs, and my guess is I'm gonna have this complaint a lot in future episodes. And while the story is impressive, with tons of memorable moments, I question just how dense and ambitious it's trying to be. There are some beautifully written characters here. From Cyan's tragedy to Edgar and Sabin's differences, the unspoken tension between Celis and Locke, and even Shadow's aloofness is compelling. But once we added the Mog and the Yeti and, oh my god, I didn't even tell you that we picked up a freaking mime along the way. Again, to compare it to Chrono Trigger, that was a smaller group of characters that we got to know, and it made for a more focused and ultimately rewarding experience. And Pokemon solves this by going in the opposite direction. One main character and your collection of fighters with no backstory or objective. It's worth noting that the entire World of Balance section, what took up most of my recap, that was the first 17 hours of gameplay. That getting the gang back together montage, that took 10 hours. It's a good story, but it's also overstuffed and rather imbalanced, with all the significant story beats spaced out in the first half, and the second half mainly devoted to gathering 14 team members one at a painstaking time, and leveling up your abilities enough to survive the rest of the game. Also, this story is a war between those who practice magic and those who don't. The main protagonist uses magic, the main villain uses magic, almost everyone in my party learns amazing spells, and at the end of the game, what happens to the magic? All the magicite is gone, so are there any espers left? If so, are they back in their world? Is there no reconciliation after this war is over? Or is the war even over? Sure, the Emperor and Kefka are gone, but is the Empire dismantled? Is there no more magic in the world? It feels like with so much time devoted to Ocean's Eleven in your entire party, I would have liked a little more time wrapping up the War of the Magi. You know, the very first thing that I was told about when I started the game. Also, let's not forget, Edgar Grimm's Miners. So, yeah, there was a lot to unpack with this one. But ultimately, where did I land? Well, of the two Final Fantasy games that I've played so far, this one is my favorite. Way to go, number three slash six. I decided that every season of Brand New Relic is going to start with a Final Fantasy game. And with so many opinions out there, I'll be curious to see if this is actually the best of the franchise. As a standalone game, however, it was good. It didn't change my mind about retro RPGs, and I don't think I'll be going back to it again, but damned if I won't be thinking about that opera house scene and that world-splitting sequence for a good long while. And even though it took me way too much time to finish this game as I would have liked, I'm glad to have it under my belt. I just hope the next game is a more forgiving genre.
Oh. Stealth. Fantastic. As always, a humongous thank you for those folks at Patreon, especially Brianne Shaw and Haley's mom. This episode took a long time to make, and you all were super patient. If you want early access or the ability to vote for future episodes, go on over to Patreon and be all Patreon-y. What's your favorite Final Fantasy? Is there a game you'd like to see me tackle? Let me know in the comments. And hitting like and subscribe and that bell are also things you could do if you feel so inclined. There's no set schedule for Season 2, so the Metal Gear Solid episode will be ready when it's ready. Seriously though, it's gotta take less time than this one did. So until then, thank you so much for watching. Thank you.